it's nice. It's a little different than what we've been doing, but it's comfortable. You know, ice water. <sighs> My mother is dead. And she's been gone for, <laughs> I'm not even sure how many years, a few years. And I know people may get angst about that, like, don't you know what day your mother died? No, I don't. I don't even know what day she was born. <laughs> but did I love her? Of course. My mother, no one could say, had an easy life. My mother had a very tough life and lived it according to the way that she determined to go. And at times, people remembered her as the funniest, most laughable, short little person you could ever imagine to walk into a restaurant or a truck stop and see and just have the most hilarious time being served quickly by a little road runner that was mouthy and kind of looked a little leathery, had a big nose, looked kind of like me, uh, pretty much like me. But she had a way of dealing with her inner feelings that kept them deep inside that only one place where could they hide and that was beneath this very boisterous exterior <laughs> laughing and sarcastic person and I grew up with sarcasm all my life and God knows it took a lot to get rid of it and it's still a challenge I guess you know for some because they're not sure if I'm sarcastic or if I'm speaking from scripture so at the end, in the, in the middle of her life, she was given God. God came into her life in a personal and intimate way. Jesus began to work in her life. Now, he never took away her sarcasm, and he never removed completely some of the bitterness of soul that she had gone through, but at the end of her life, she was remembered as a woman of God because of the directions and practical realities that she gave to people, and she worked in a ministry and shared with people, and to this day, you know, God bless her that she's in heaven, and there's no doubt about that, that's the easy part. So, because I know that, I don't have that angst that most people have that, oh, I miss my mother. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't. She was a good person to talk to, and I enjoyed it. But, one of the, two of the things she gave me, one, she gave me my laughter, which is deep and rolling and bursts out at most unexpected times. But the other thing she gave me was an interesting thing that I'll never forget, you know, and God brings it to mind every now and then, is that when a crisis came up in my life, I used to go to her and I'd talk to her on the phone or I would visit with her and I would share with her. I was the first one saved and, you know, I should know to go to the Lord. But, you know, sometimes I went to my mother and, you know, she would... Listen, and then she would, like any other mother, you know, if she had some money or some food, she would feed me, and then she'd slip me, like, you know, a dollar or two dollars or something, you know, and just like grandmothers give their little kids presents, you know, she would slip some money to me, you know, because lots of times, the only time I came to my mother was maybe in need or maybe some, for some reassurance, and part of me might have been looking for a hug, but <laughs> instead I got food and, and money, you know, well, that was good enough for me, you know, like, oh, well, but... There came a day, one time, when she had grown in the Lord, and I had a big circumstance come up, and I don't remember what it was, but it was something that she made a statement to me, and I was, matter of fact, it was on the phone, and she said something interesting that God used as his voice to me, and she sa I said, and explained to her, hinting at my problem, and she said, what are you going to do about it? Not offering a solution not proffering her wisdom or her idea of what I should do because that's what she always did. The day she did that, I never forgot. And I never again went back to her or used her in some manipulative way to get confirmation or reconciliation or some, you know, maybe even money or food or whatever. But she said to me very bluntly was that, well, what are you going to do about it? 
and I made my apologies to her, you know, gradually and kept talking to her and visited, you know, but then got off the phone and cried. And I was a man. Because at that moment, I had been brought to the purse strings were cut. The salvation that was meant to be from God was taken away from my choice of direction of looking to someone else to answer what only God could speak to me about. And when it finally sank in that God had done it, I was happy. Because until you let go of your support network, until you walk away from those things that are helping you to be dependent upon them other than God, you'll never know what it's like to have a personal living God. And in that way, I was so thrilled that day that it happened to me. Now my sister, God bless her if she sees this video, she'll kill me. But my sister, Mary Lynn, used to call my mother every single day, you know, and from morning, noon, and night, she would talk to my mother all day long, and whatever came up, it was mom this and mom that, and she'd talk to her, and no matter what it was, it was as though her faith was mom, and her idol was mom, and her God was mom, and it was almost like, you know, the Jewish mother, you know, but worse than that, it was a dependency, and yet it was needed, and God did it, and God allowed it. But I know the biggest shock that came to my sister was God decided that he was going to cut the purse strings, and so he did. My mother dropped dead walking to a corral to feed her horse, and my sister, Mary Lynn, found her. And you know what? My sister didn't lose it. My sister didn't lose her faith. My sister didn't fall apart. She didn't come unglued. She didn't lose it and be babbling. She took care of business. She took care of what needed to be done. She moved on in life. And this day, though she still misses her and she does things to celebrate her death or to remember her, and in my own way I do, but she's more still a worrier. But my sister grew from that moment on into a woman of God that now shares from her own experience and wisdom. You may need to grow up at some point in time in your life, and I hope you learn that looking to your support network isn't the same as looking to God himself. The baffling call of God and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished, and they understood none of these things. Luke 18:31 and 34. God called Jesus Christ to what seemed unmitigated disaster. Jesus Christ called his disciples to see him put to death. He led every one of them to the place where their hearts were broken. Jesus Christ's life was an absolute failure from every standpoint but God's. But what seemed failure from man's standpoint was a stupendous and tremendous triumph from God's point of view because God's purposes is never man's purpose. There comes the baffling call of God in our lives also, when God will call you. The call of God can never be stated explicitly. It is implicit. The call of God is like the call of the sea. No one hears it, but the one who has the nature of the sea in him knows it. They are pulled like the tide. It cannot be stated definitely what the call of God is, too, because his call is to be in comradeship with himself or in fellowship with him alone for his own purposes. And the test is to believe that God knows what he is after and you don't. The things that happen do not happen by chance or circumstance. They happen entirely in and by the decree of God. It is his choice and his will. God is working out his purposes. If we are in communion with God and recognize that he is taking us into his purposes and not our own, we shall no longer try to find out what his purposes are. We shall accept to do as he says. As we go on in the Christian life, it gets simpler because we are less inclined to say, now why did God allow this to happen? Because he chose to. Behind the whole thing lies the compelling of God. 
the unction, the drawing of God by Him to you, from Him to you for Him. There's a divinity that shapes our end. A Christian is one who trusts the wits and wisdom of God and not his own understanding. If we have a purpose of our own, it destroys simplicity and the leisurelessness which ought to characterize the children of God. It ought to be so simple that we can let go, let God, and let Him lead the way. It ought to be so simple that, like the children that stood in the fire or Daniel himself, whether we live or whether we die, whether we rejoice or whether we're sad for a moment, we do all things by the God who works in us, through us, by us, for us, and will accomplish in us His own purposes. The more you understand that, the less you worry about the results. <laughs>